Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video I'm going to go through the basics of DC motor modeling. We'll start with an electrical circuit that approximates that of a DC motor, and then uh, do an example where we use a DC motor to uh, actuate a flexible coupled disk system. Okay, so let's start with the DC motor circuit. And I'll explain these elements in just a minute. Okay, so a DC motor, if you've ever looked at one, has a couple of terminals where you can apply a voltage. So we need some sort of a voltage source, and I'll just denote that as Vs. Then the motor itself can be modeled as having a resistance and an inductance. And it's typically denoted as the armature resistance RA and the armature inductance LA. And if we're doing a circuit analysis, which we'll do in just a minute, we'd have a voltage drop across those two elements. Then as the motor spins, there is a back EMF, a back voltage generated, and we'll denote that as VE. And when we apply a voltage to those terminals of the motor, it creates a current through this circuit. Now there's two equations to keep in mind when working with DC motors. That is that the back EMF is equal to Ke theta m dot, where theta m dot is the rotational rate of the motor's rotor, the motor shaft, the business end of the motor. The other equation is that the torque imposed onto that shaft via the motor is tau m equals kt times ia. So as we run a current through that motor, we're actually generating a torque onto the shaft that is proportional to it. RA, LA, KE, and KT are parameters of the motor, and you would typically find them in, in the motor's data sheet. One other thing to keep in mind is that if consistent units are used, then KE and KT are actually numerically identical. So sometimes you may only come across a Ke or a Kt, a back EMF constant or a torque constant, and then you can use that um, for uh, both quantities uh, when doing your analysis. So let's go ahead and use KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and analyze this circuit. We have Vs minus RAIA minus LADIADT the inductor and minus VE and I'll just write VE as KE theta M dot and that's equal to zero. That's it. Um, I could go ahead and, and uh, I guess reorganize this just ever so slightly as so. and maybe put a box around it. So this first order differential equation is the electrical side of the DC motor. Its input is the voltage source Vs and uh, its output is well whatever you want to make it but one of the things that happens is it creates a current inside the motor and if the shaft is spinning then there's a back EMF that's, that opposes that input voltage to the tune of Ke theta m dot. Now let's go ahead and look at the mechanical side of the motor. Um, if we just look at the motor itself and not connected to an, not as part of an example where we use it to drive something else, then really the motor is pretty simple. It just has an inertia associated with it. This is the part that you'd see sticking out of the end of the motor, but inside the motor housing itself is typically a little bit more inertia. Um, and we would denote that as JM. I checked off a bunch of things up here that were constants that you would find in a data sheet for a motor. JM is another one. And sometimes you'll find a viscous damping coefficient. So the uh, rotor could be spinning within the housing and, and uh, one way to uh, model the losses that occur in there is using a viscous damping effect, BM. That would be another coefficient or another parameter that you would find in the data sheet. So now let's try to put some of this together. Oh, hey, one other thing. Of course, the 
torque that's applied to that is tau m and that's equal to kT ia. So when I turn this voltage on here, Vs, it generates a current in this circuit here and that is what causes this torque onto the motor's rotor. And of course when you apply a torque to something it usually spins depending on what it's attached to. So now let's go ahead and do an example. And here's the example we'll do. Here's our motor again. JM. And this thing is attached with a flexible shaft and I'll say that it has uh, flexible coupling with some torsional stiffness K and that's attached to another disc that has inertia JL. Okay, so let's just go ahead and uh, do the two parts to this. There's the electrical part, which we've already done actually, and the mechanical part. The electrical part I'll just redraw the circuit one more time. There's our armature resistance, our armature inductance, and here's how I'll show the back EMF here. And again, we have this equation that pops out of the analysis. and I can just put a box around that. So our electrical part is done. And now let's move on to the mechanical part. I'm going to abstract these two disks for my free body diagrams as just a couple of circles. For this one, I'll say that the positive uh, displacement, theta m, is in that direction. And the positive displacement for the load is in that direction. As soon as I do that, I can put my inertial moments onto the free body diagram. And what else do I have? On the, on the JM disk, I also have my motor torque, tau M. And of course, that's equal to KTIA. Now let's say that I am taking into consideration the viscous damping associated with the motor, then as this thing spins, there's going to be a moment opposing that rate of change of the motor to the tune of bm theta m dot. The only other moment that I have to consider is that due to the flexible coupling. So figure out how to apply that, what I'll do is, is I'll put both of the disks into a positive displacement. And I'll say that the theta L is a, is a wee bit bigger than the theta M. So what happens then is the, the torsional spring, the torsional uh, coupling is twisting and it's pulling theta M around in this direction to the tune of K theta L minus theta m. And that's going to have an equal and opposite moment on the other disk. So it'll be like so. And I'm done. This is the JL disk, by the way. So now I can just sum up all these moments and write down my equations of motion. So let me do the motor first. I have that term. that term. Oops, this is in the opposite direction. That's my flexible coupler. And I think, oh, I have one more to go. Can't forget that one. That's that term. And for this disk, uh, much simpler, JL theta L double dot plus K theta L 
minus theta m equals zero. I can box these two equations and I'm done. So just one last comment. Um, well, I guess two last comments. If we look at these two boxes, what I have are a first order differential equation in the armature current. When I apply a voltage to this system, the armature current gets excited. That couples into the theta m equation down here, and theta m starts going. When theta m starts turning, this term does something, detracts from the voltage source in a sense. Um, but also what happens is the flexible coupler couples up with theta l, and so the load starts spinning. So simply by using our one input of voltage, we get the whole system wiggling around. The other comment I wanted to make is we have two second order differential equations and one first. So if we were going to represent this in state space form, a reasonable choice of states would be something like this. Armature current, motor angle, motor speed, load angle, and load speed. Certainly there are other state definitions we could use, but those seem like reasonable ones. So that's it. Uh, just to summarize, introduce the electrical side of a DC motor and the mechanical side, and introduce those two equations that relate the back EMF to the rotational rate of the shaft and the motor torque to the armature current. Those are key for motor analysis. And then did this example with a motor driving a disc connected to the motor via a flexible coupler, which is a pretty common situation actually. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.